This is Rob from the Encyclopedia team. It is with great honor we have Professor Vlakto Vedro for this interview. Thank you very much for coming. It's all my pleasure. Thank you. So, Professor Vedro, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I am a, a research professor at the University of Oxford, and I also work um, at the National University of Singapore uh, at the Center for Quantum Technologies. Um, I'm a physicist by training. Uh, I studied undergraduate physics at Imperial College in London. Uh, and then I stayed on to do my PhD in physics as well at Imperial College. Uh, most of my career has really been um, jobs either at Imperial College in London, I was at the University of Leeds, and now the latest I'm at the University of Oxford. So that was maybe the last 12 years of my career. Impressive career you have had. So could you please tell us a little bit more background on your research topic, quantum physics? Of course, it's, um, it's a very exciting topic because, as you know, uh, that's the most accurate description of nature that we have. Um, it works at the very tiny scales. If you go at the level of atoms, at the level of particles of light, photons, if you go into the subatomic regions, even smaller particles than that, we know that the laws of quantum physics are fully obeyed. What's exciting to us nowadays is to test the other side of this. If we go into the macroscopic domain, if we have large systems with large number of atoms and molecules, the question is also whether quantum laws are the right, correct laws to describe the world at that level. So it's a very exciting uh, research direction because we started with a tiny microscopic systems and now we are pushing this into the huge macroscopic domain. And the question we are asking really, fundamentally speaking, is um, whether quantum theory is a universal description of everything that we can think of in nature. Um, the one of the biggest applications of this um, is quantum computation. So once we know that we can control large systems in a fully quantum mechanical way, we actually know that we can make computers which are much more powerful than any computer we currently have. So it's a, it's a beautiful direction, I think, because it combines the fundamental questions. What is nature like? What is the ultimate theory of nature? With a very applied side of things, you know, how do we make the fastest and the smallest computers? I can really feel you're passionate about quantum physics. So what makes you want to research quantum physics in the first place? Did you get any influence from other people? Yes, many other people. In fact, I think um, I learned about it very little in my high school. It was, it was at the level of simple equations, something that actually comes before proper quantum mechanics. Um, I must admit, in my high school, it sounded very um, unusual and weird to me and esoteric, uh, although there was something already magical and mysterious about it. I think that the real, um, the, the real point at which it kind of switched on for me, if you, if you see what I mean, was uh, when I was an undergraduate at, at the Imperial College. In my first year, um, I started to realize when I was taught the first year quantum mechanics, I started to realize that these properties of quantum systems are really extraordinary. Quantum systems behave completely differently to anything that we see in the macroscopic world. Um, qu every quantum particle, every electron, every atom, every photon can exist in many different states at the same time. So you can have an atom that sits in one position and in another position simultaneously. That's called a superposition of two different places. And I thought this was really mind blowing. You know, how can it be like that? Um, and the deeper I went into these kind of properties, the, the more beautiful it looked to me, the more coherent and it really made perfect sense. So I would say round, the, round about the age of 20, when I was an undergraduate, it really started to switch on. And I thought this is something I really want to do for the rest of my life. 
We are really glad to hear those stories you had. So, what is the interesting or innovative part about your research? I think the, the most innovative part is really um, the fact that we are asking uh, these very unusual questions, uh, which are basically uh, to do with um, large objects. They could be inanimate objects. They could be pieces of matter, um, which are traditionally the systems you study in physics, or they could be living systems. And I think what, what is really unusual here is that we are asking very similar questions in both domains. Um, so, so one of the questions, for instance, is can living systems utilize quantum mechanics in the same way that we can do this in the laboratory? Um, are there some effects in the living systems which require particles to be in many different states at the same time? Um, and I think probing living systems um, is really innovative. It's very complicated. It requires a high degree of technology to be able to really control systems at that level. So one of the recent, um, one of the recent pieces of research was actually to take a tardigrade, which is a tiny micro object living system and put it together with a quantum mechanical bit of information, a superconductor that encodes a quantum mechanical bit. So what we studied is what kind of state does one get when you combine a living system with a physical superconducting system. And I think this is the direction um, for future research, which is most exciting because we are asking really, does quantum mechanics fully describe all of these systems? Or could it be that quantum mechanics will fail and we will discover another theory of physics? Is there something beyond quantum physics? I totally agree that quantum physics must be complicated. So what are the challenges that you are facing currently? The main, uh, the main challenge is um, scaling up the experiments. So when we learn how to when we learn how to co uh, combine um, one atom with another atom and treat it completely quantum mechanically, we get these states that are called entangled states. Quantum entanglement is a famous effect. Um, Einstein talked about it a lot. Uh, Schrodinger talked about it a lot. The famous Schrodinger cat experiment uh, is one of those experiments where he talks about uh, entanglement. Um, the main difficulty is that when you have lots of quantum systems, um, there is usually a lot of noise from the environment in these systems. And being able to control them in the precise way, not letting them interact with the environment to lose their quantum information, if you like, that's by far the biggest challenge we are facing. So if you talk um, about even the most sophisticated laboratory in the world, they can maybe handle up to 50, maybe 100 quantum bits. But going beyond that, the complexity simply becomes too big to be able to do it. So I think on the experimental side, we really need to figure out how to overcome this difficulty of complexity, how to eliminate noise, how to error correct for, for this kind of noisy effects and therefore to build up larger and larger quantum states. I think that's kind of going to define the next probably 10 years of research. It sounds like there's just so much more to be explored in quantum physics. So is there any next move from you? And what is your prediction? Um, my, uh, I'm extremely optimistic about this. I am uh, very optimistic in particular about testing the interface between quantum physics and the theory of gravity that we call general relativity. Um, these two theories apply in completely different domains of the universe. So like I said, quantum physics describes relatively small systems um, uh, which have a handful of, of particles that interact together. Gravity describes very large astronomical systems. It describes planets and stars, um, so, you know, solar systems, 
um, galaxies and bigger. Um, these two theories have never been tested at the same time. So what we are trying to really find is the domain where both quantum mechanics and gravity play an important role. Um, this is a theory that people call quantum gravity, but we actually don't have that theory yet. We, we have no idea what to expect there. There are many theoretical proposals, but no one has really done any tests. My hope is that as we make these quantum systems larger and larger, at some point gravity will, will start to matter. And, and with my colleague Chiara Marletto, I've actually proposed an experiment where you take two massive objects, put them in a superposition, let them interact gravitationally, and then test really whether gravity is also quantum mechanical. So to me, this is probably um, the most important goal on this side, on the foundational side of research. On the applied side, the, the, the important question really is, can we make a universal quantum computer? Can we make a large scale quantum computer that's as big as our conventional computers, but really fully quantum mechanical? Um, I'm very optimistic about the technological progress. So I think already within the next um, 10 years, we will get some very fundamental results that may even force us to rethink the foundations of physics. That was just great news to hear. I'm sure quantum physics has just so much more to be explored and tried out. And I, I sure hope the future will be bright. Me too. So, Professor Vajok, it really makes me wonder what would the future look like? What is the real life application when the set goal is complete? The biggest application of, um, of quantum computers is really simulating very complex systems. These are systems that are so complex that the traditional current computers really cannot compute fast enough to make these predictions. So when, when we are talking about chemistry, drug development, for instance, various applications in biology and medicine, predicting weather patterns, complex weather patterns, all of these systems are so complicated that no computer can ever really calculate well enough and fast enough, it would run out of memory to be able to predict uh, these systems. But quantum computers, if we have a large universal quantum computer, could actually target some of these and make computations much faster. So they would really have a huge range of applications in the real world. So before we finish, is there any acknowledgement you would like to make? Oh, I think there is. Um, there are many, many acknowledgements. Um, probably the, um, the latest acknowledgement that I would uh, like to mention, certainly, which has made um, many of these things possible, is the Moore Foundation. So there is certainly uh, the Moore Foundation in the United States has recently given, um, given me um, uh, some money to really explore these quantum effects in the biological domain. Um, and the other strong acknowledgement I would like to make is towards the Center for Quantum Technologies in Singapore, which has invested um, a great deal into developing quantum computers and the related technologies. So I think both of these institutions have funded a lot of my research and the, these two directions have been developing in parallel. Thank you. Professor Vajo, we wish you and your fellow colleagues the best of luck on your future endeavors. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Ron. It's my pleasure.